Let's start. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jakub Namrudalik. Uh, this is the dog that we are on. So now is the pl place to ch uh, moment to change your room if that's not what you were expecting. So as I said, uh, I'm Jakub Namrudalik, and I'm kind of a boring person. I got 18, 18 years of experience in designing systems. And you can read everything online. You can Google me. So basically, we'll skip over that. I work for a company called Bottega, and we are consulting company, we train people, we do workshops, and we also help us in normal development, basically, with the team for a few years. So uh, that's what we do. And yeah, and this talk is about architecture, but from a perspective of the, the, like the mistakes of the, in the architecture. And what I've learned during those 18 years is that there are no idiots, no stupid people who are designing an architecture, right? But we have a lot of different architectures that are or systems that are designed in a bad way from our perspective. And it's usually due either to, you know, things change over time, nobody's refactoring architecture, or because of the bad education, so basically, you don't, people don't know uh, enough, uh, or the lack of experience. But most of the, uh, the time, it's actually due to really bad managers. So, 18 years ago, I was a student, I had four months of commercial experience as a developer, and they asked me to design and build an enter enterprise resource planning system. What could possibly go wrong, right? So you always hire a student to do something like that. So for three years, a few teams were actually building this kind of a system, and I was responsible for all the mistakes and all the horrors that they had, because I designed something like this. Well, what would you, would you expect, right, for, from somebody who does, has uh, no experience whatsoever? And I would blame, for, for this mistake, I would, of course, blame the management, but also I would blame all the books that I've read, because I had really bad education at Polish universities. So that was my problem. Now, 18 years later, and what I do is I actually build and design systems, and I teach other people how to do it, and I help them design uh, their own systems, right? So I kind of... I'm back in the situation when I meet myself from 18 years ago, because a lot of different people are actually like, you know, the younger version of me, where they, were, they have half a year of experience in programming, and now they have to design a large system. So I, I thought that I'm going to give you a talk if, uh, to like, just throw as much uh, important stuff as I can in 45 minutes, and see if that helps you at, at, uh, at all, because, you know, Architecture is a complex thing. It usually takes about three days to even start uh, to, correct, for, to do a proper workshop on that. So the first thing I would like to know back then was that there is no such thing as good architecture. There is only architecture optimized for something. And you have to be explicit about what you optimize for. Because if you don't, then I join a company, I ask the guys there, what, do, what is the system optimized for? I have five people and I have six different opinions about what they optimize the system for, right? And they build it that way. Each person builds something different, optimizing for something completely different, and there's a problem for that. And another problem is that people don't know, do not know what to optimize for. So if I ask developers, what do you do? They say, oh, we want to have very good performance. Or maybe we want to be, uh, you know, to scale very well, right? And the problem is that you know, most of the systems actually can run on a potato, on a Com Commodore 64 or something like that. And during these 18 years of my career so far, every single performance problem that I had was due to something, that, something stupid that I did. It wasn't due to the limitation of the hardware. It wasn't due to the limitation of the frameworks. It was always my mistake, okay? Now, seriously, think about this. This is a TI-84 running Doom on a CPU from 1975 powered by a bunch of potatoes. So what do you need all those servers for, right? Now, to be honest, this is not exactly Doom. This is more like, more like a Wolfenstein. But please Google that out, and you'll see what's possible, right? So what do you optimize for? If you know, great. If you don't know what to optimize your architecture for, choose one of those two. The first one is maintainability. So basically, how easy it is to maintain the system later on. And how much time are you going to spend on debugging, on 
answering un uh, questions and basically, uh, you know, trying to fix the system or keep it alive. The other one is extensibility, which means how expensive is it going to be for you to actually add new features? And this is very important because with those two, if you optimize for only those two, what will happen is you will have more time to develop new things, right? And that's exactly what the business wants. Now, if you are a startup, there is another one, and that's flexibility, which is, well, for startups, usually they either go down or they pivot, basically change the direction. So something I build today is something that is not, I'm not going to keep building in the next three months. So then you can optimize the system for something completely different and basically try to build tools. Ask the guys from MongoDB Corporation, what did they build before they actually were named uh, MongoDB Corporation, okay? And see how that works. Now, that being said, now let's try to actually design something, right? And three most popular um, like flavors of uh, design right, uh, that I see are the modular monolith microservices, which is distributed synchronous system, or the microservices, even based microservices, distributed asynchronous system. And you will hear a lot of people telling you something like, you should never do microservices first, or what, what, what makes you think that you can create microservices when you cannot create a modular monolith, or something like that. And I, that, that really pisses me off because you should understand what's behind those trade-offs and decisions instead of, you know, getting something uh, as a face value, never do microservices or always do microservices, right? So everybody talks about the benefits of those different approaches. So let, let me talk about, you know, the problems, because you will find a lot of talks about the benefits. So the modular monolith system and the problems, first of all, you will have a big risk deployment. And that's guaranteed. Why is that? Well, first of all, you cannot actually deploy a single you know, module part of your system. That's a monolith, right? And the second thing is, if you have 50 people, 100 people, and you want to deploy just the simple small fix that you have for your code, there'll be that fix and another 300 commits out there, right? So with a monolithic system, there's a big chance somebody else out there did uh, uh, and created an, uh, uh, a bug, basically, and there is a memory leak, for example. And the memory leak can take the whole JVM down. So every single deployment in a monolithic system is a risky one. If you don't like stress, or if your business cannot accept this risk, don't do monoliths. The next problem is that uh, the broken window effect, which means that, okay, so now we have 50 people working on a single monolithic system. Now, either they are very self-disciplined, and I haven't seen a group like that, or they'll build different parts of the system in a different way, right? And so when you look at it, this, and you look at the code base, it will look like shit, usually. On a local level, that will be fine. On a large scale, not really. So you have to pay a lot of attention to actually keep things you know, in check and basically uh, keep the discipline out there. And it's difficult, it's hard. If you don't want to do it, don't build a monolithic system. Then it's easy to break the architecture. So I recommend tools like, for example, ArcUnit, because otherwise what will happen is you will hire a junior developer, and that junior developer doesn't know, you know about the, all the rules, doesn't have your experience, and later on they will just break the, uh, uh, the architecture of the system by just connecting things that shouldn't be connected. ArcUnit is a great tool to protect against that. But be prepared that you will have to communicate a lot and actually talk with all these people. And I've seen systems, big, large monolithic systems for 200 people, where the only job of the architect was actually to go and talk with people, explaining to them all the stuff that they needed to know about the architecture. That's it. That's, the, that's their job. Now, the next problem is that every single monolith has got a limited um, set of technologies that you can have. And that's, that might not be a problem from the perspective of a project, but it's a problem from the perspective of a company. Why? Because after three years, most of the developers will actually leave, the good ones, the people that are, you know, very, very good and they're ambitious. And they don't want to work in the same technology all over again for the next, I don't know, five years, right? With microservices, that's not a problem, really. So be prepared for that and think in advance. And then there is a basic problem, which is, People don't know what a module is. How can you build a, monotic, uh, a modular monolith when you don't know what a module is, right? Show me a definition. 
The problem is books are not got that great in this, and there's a lot of books about architecture. Not too many of them give a definition of a module that it would be useful. Uh, so here's my definition. It's not the best definition. It might not even apply to your system, right? It works for me, and that's the talk for me, right, 18 years ago. So here's the definition. First, a single module is responsible for a process, not for data. That's important, and I'll show later on what that means. The module is a vertical slice, so it's got all the layers, the access to the DB, the UI, whatever you use, OK? Now, it has got to be, be easy to identify where's the entry point for that module, right? So what's the API? And then, who does this module work with? So collaborators. A module should have its own database, and I'm not talking about you know, physical database, just its own tables, and you cannot do any kind of queries no joins, no inserts, no reading of any data from that module database. It's internal, OK? Treat it as a black box. Now, that's encapsulation, right? Now, let's go further. We encapsulate everything, all, every single class, except for the API. So you shouldn't be able to touch it. You shouldn't be able to see it in your large application, in your modular model, it, right? And if you do domain-driven design, then a single module is, you, is always inside a single bounded context. You never mix two bounded contexts in a module. But you can have several modules for a bounded context. That's completely fine. And if you do it like this, what happens is that a module is actually a candidate for a microservice. Doesn't mean it has to be. Doesn't mean you have to pull it out. But it, it is a, a, a candidate on that. And I have a talk about you know, how to actually code that in, for example, Java. Now, when you define modules like this, the next problem is, how small should they be? OK? And here's an example. Let's say that you've got a system that has got to, every single day, at the end of the day, has got to send invoices to all the users, right? Who, who were using that system just to get the money. Now, what a typical architect, young architect, would do, they would create something like, OK, this is a module called Invoice Creator. That's it. The job is to create invoices. That's the module. The, the, the job is done, right? The thing is, if you think about what, ex what exactly do we have to do to do that, then the algorithm looks like something like this. First, you need to learn about how do actually invoices work. So basically, re read something about you know, the taxes, invoicing, all that stuff. This is the legal stuff. You have to understand it to be able to create a proper invoice. The next problem is you have to create a file, a PDF file, for example, right? So what happens then? Well, this is simple stuff. You take a library, and you start using that library to create the PDF. And it's a very simple thing. And it takes a week. Why does it take a week, right? Because, well, from my experience, at least, all those libraries kind of suck. And you can have a lot of different problems you know, with formatting or anything like that. And then you have another problem. We need to send them out through SMTP, for example, or you know, anything. So then you have to you know, take a library, like maybe Apache Camel, Spring Integration, whatever you want, read the documentation for that library, and implement that. Now see, these are three different parts of knowledge which are disconnected. So what we could do, we could have three different people working on this if we split that module into three different modules where for every single module, all you have to know is the, the, the documentation for that problem, OK? And that makes it easier to actually comprehend the module and to be able to develop it. Because every single time you have a problem with, for example, PDF creation, you only go to the PDF creator module, generator module, and you, there is less thing to put into your hand, uh, uh, head because you know, there's less code. That's easy. So my advice is this. Always, if, you, if, if your process basically requires different areas of knowledge, and you can have several people working on the, this process as, and having different knowledge as long as they are having different modules, then split it into different modules. If you have to, to implement different modules, you have to have the same area of knowledge, so basically you have to learn the same thing, it makes no sense to actually split it. Simple. And Unix is built this way, so it's OK. Now, the, if you don't do mon uh, modules like this, I usually see that people end up with non-modular monolith, which is something you don't want to have, right? 
So let's move to another system, distributed synchronous system called microservices. Now, we are assuming that this is real microservices where you have independent deployments, because if you don't, that's not microservices. What's the, what are the problems with that? First of all, you need to have uh, eventual consistency, so you have to learn that. Don't fight against it. This is actually easy. And take the speed of light into account. We'll learn about that a little more later on. Then the second thing is it requires a DevOps culture, which means developers operating their system on production. What that means if, is if you have a bank which has got operations, you got no access to production, you cannot see logs, you cannot restart the system, you cannot do anything like that, you're going to have a bad time designing microservices or actually implementing them, right? So don't do it. Change the organization first. I know, I know, it's easy, you know, change the organization of the bank first. Well, you can hire me, I'll take a lot of money, I'll explain to them exactly the thing you already know, and maybe they'll change something they usually don't, but then they'll pay me a lot of money, so at least I'll be happy. Okay, now the next thing is, sooner or later what will happen is you will have to have a team for tooling. And there's a lot of different problems which are common, like logging, like uh, uh, security, for example. So basically, these common problems, you can read it uh, all about in the book Team Topologies, and basically those, the common problems should be solved uh, in a single way, or maybe not in a single way, but like we would like to have them solved so that we can focus on the business stuff. So m sooner or later, you will have a team for tooling, and you'll have a lot of that. And then you'll have communication inefficiency, which means you have to build real models, okay? And we'll talk about later on as well. And the communication complexity, which means you need to learn resiliency. And that's difficult, because most of you, I assume, from, from my experience of me going through different companies, are not very good at obs uh, observability, okay? And that means that you don't even know, usually, that you have problems. And that includes, includes even teams that I work with on a daily basis, right? So you have to learn all those things. And if it's not reactive, if your system is not reactive, you will have suboptimal CPU usage. Why is that? Well, because if we had a monolithic system, what would happen? Let's say we have 100 people. There would be usually one, maybe two people, who actually can do this kind of, yeah, I'm going to write stress tests for this system, right? And when I write those stress tests, I will find out all the bottlenecks. And then we can fix those bottlenecks. Usually it's, uh, it's about, you know, the uh, things like, for example, uh, threat pools, yeah? So we can fix those or queues. We can fix those and basically tune them, tune them to the situation when the system doesn't suck anymore. Now, with microservices, what happens is that you got uh, teams of five, perhaps five people per team, right? That's got 15 microservices. None of those people actually care about performance. And none of, sometimes I even find a lot of teams that have no idea about how many threads do they have in their thread pools. So they are completely unaware about that situation. What happens when the system is getting slower? Right? So the system is slow. We look at the CPU. There's like 20% of the usage of the CPU. Right? But people don't, don't think about it. They don't, they don't do the stress testing. So what they do is they spin another microservice. It's easier than to actually optimize the, uh, the thread pool there. So if you have 10,000 microservices, or maybe 10,000 servers, and you get microservices on them, and you're using only 20% of the CPU, that's a lot of waste. And then end-to-end -end testing is not possible anymore because, well, independent deployments. So basically, you are never ready, you, you can never prepare the uh, testing environment just like the production environment, and just be ready for that. Now, the event-driven systems are the next thing that I, I actually I care a lot about, and I love them, but they have their own problems. So event-driven systems are uh, when you have, usually have a message bus, right? Because in theory, you could do it without message bus. Nobody does that. So when you want to have like Apache Kafka, Apache Pulsar, whatever else you want, right? Somebody has got to do a PhD on this. And the problem is, it's not a simple thing. You have to really spend time learning this. And you won't have time to actually implement any, fe any features in that time. And you have to keep it alive, right? And if you think that you are going to go into something as a service, so basically it's going to be closed source, and that's going to solve all your problems, I got bad news for you. It's even worse. Because then you have to first learn all the marketing bullshit, then learn which of those marketing bullshit is actually true, and the rest of it is just lies. And then you have to find people who actually wrote blog posts about something that actually works. And you try to find out the solution when you don't have the code. So basically, that's how it works. So it's even worse. And then you can go to, like, let's use open source system, 
pro provided as a, uh, uh, as a software as a service, and actually that would make the best uh, that would be the best idea. Except that first of all, it, it's expensive, and you have to do a PhD on this anyway. So that's how you deal with it. Now the next problem is people create a lot of chaos with asynchronous systems, and even driven especially. So first of all, they do not understand that there are different types of events. There are events which go, which are public. Basically, your team throws it into the air or in Kafka, and basically everybody can use that. Now, this is important because you have to have the versioning. You have to think about, you know, I cannot just spam as many events as I want. There is actually other consumers there. I don't know about them. I have to think about all of this, right? On the other way, on the other hand, there is the team level kind of event where I have 15 microservices, all of them uh, uh, my, my team actually wrote, and so we know all the producers and all the consumers. In such a scenario, what happens is that you can go against microservices. You can even say, okay, you know, we got a lot of stuff on this topic, but I don't like it, and there's, there was an error there. Let's actually throw all the events there again, and let's not care about, you know, versioning, for example, because we can bring up the two instances, the producer and consumer, at the same time. That goes against microservices, but it works. If it's stupid but it, and it works, it's not stupid anymore, right? And then the next problem is, and there is also the private events, which is even worse. So the problem with this is, if you don't know that, people will try to use your team events as public events. If you allow them to do so, bad things will happen when you break the rules. And you want to break the rules because efficiency. So sometimes you will want to have this situation when you break those rules. Now, the next problem is people mix uh, the terms of event-driven architecture, event sourcing, and event storming. There's an event there, right? So what's the difference? People usually think that this is the same thing. And it can be the same thing, but it doesn't have to. Because event-driven is about communication patterns. Event sourcing is about the persistence. And then event storming is about the business, OK? So different things, and please remember, they don't have to be the same. Don't assume they are the same unless you need them to be the same. OK. So then we go to actually how do modules and microservices communicate. And there are only three ways you can do this. Well, maybe there are more, but I found only three. And that would be queries, where, where you ask for something. So this is a question. This is synchronous by nature. Then you got commands, which means that you, this is an intention. You're saying, please do something for me, right? And it can be synchronous or asynchronous. And there are events, which is usually something that, OK, this is a statement about the fact that already happened. That's it. Now, when you know those three, then you can, have, you can use them, right? Now, what are the problems with them? First is the query. So here's the situation when you have a user that ne needs to search for a nearby cars. So it asks, asks the module car finder, right? Now, we have the information about the, car, the availability of the cars actually in another module called car rental. And we have another module called locator, which has got the position of the car. We need to combine them so that we can return the locations of the cars which are available. The problem is, how will the query look like? These are different databases. You cannot join them, right? You cannot do a query with the join to keep them as modules. So what you would do is you will call car rental. You will get 50 cars or maybe 500 cars, you would call call locator with giving this 500 IDs to the other module. Now imagine what kind of a, a SQL query that is with 500 IDs. That's not performant at all, right? And if it's microservices, it's even worse, because apart from the fact that you are doing the query again, uh, you will also add all the uh, basically networking and the, the, um, uh, the calls, the networking calls, and be even slower than that. How can you solve this? Every time you have a query, think about whether it wouldn't be easier to actually change and switch to the event. So basically, we are moving the arrow the other direction. Now we are building a read model, which means that car rental will give us information. Car was rented, car was returned. The locator will give us the location. Car moved, right? And then we build it inside our local database. What are the benefits? If, if it's a, just a module, right, then the great thing about it is you don't have to do any joins anymore. There are no two inefficient queries. There is just one very efficient query because you got the, the data, the normalized, just the way you want it. If this is microservices, it's even better because this is called data locality, which means to be able to answer as fast as possible, I need to have the data on me already. OK? So every time you have a, a query, think whether the event wouldn't be actually better. Now, with commands, there is another problem. Commands are intentions, right? 
So Carbental can say something like the cost, calculate cost to cost calculator. The problem with that is, if these are two different modules or microservices on, of two different teams, right? You need to understand that the team responsible for car rental needs to understand when the cost should be calculated. So basically, with, uh, with comments, you have to think in terms, I do understand the rest of the processes around me, right? And that's OK at the very beginning, but it's not true very fast. So after half a year, that's not true, and we are actually calculating the cost, not during the rental, but after that, or maybe five minutes after that, or maybe on return, or something like this. And that's why it's very brittle. It's OK to do this kind of things when you have a single team, but if you have several teams, don't do it at all. So what can we do? Again, we can turn this into events, right? So we can say, car was rented. And then we are only stating the truth, and we are reasoning based on the local state. So whatever we say is always true, because we don't, do not try to uh, think in terms of processes of other teams and other modules. That's much easier to maintain. It's, it's true for much longer than that, OK? So that's all great. So am I suggesting turning everything into events then? Actually, no, because there has a lot of problems with events. The first thing nobody talks about is actually the baseline, which is what happens when those two different, let's say, microservices now, right? Those two different microservices have different data sets. How is that possible? And we are not talking about eventual consistency. We are talking about eventual non-consistency at all. There are just errors there, right? Here's what happens. When the problem is on the cost calculator side, so basically on the consumer of the event, in theory, what you could do, you could go back to the beginning of the queue or, or the topic and read all those events, fix the error, deploy again, read all those events, and you'll have a good state, right? Cool. Now, the problem is, first of all, you got data retention, so you don't have all the events. And the second thing is, the producer can have it back. So what happens if the producer, the car rental, didn't send me that event, or that event was wrong, and basically there, was no, no, there were nulls, there were no data, the data was incorrect, something like that? The only way to do it is actually to, again, create that data again, send it over from car rental, so basically create like a baseline. I'm going to give you everything I know about, right? All the rentals. I'm sending over to you. And the cost calculator can pick it up and rebuild the read models that they have, OK? So that works great, except it's problematic. You have to think about it. You have to design for this. You have to build that. And then you have to think, in what, what if the cost calculator is actually indempotent and we already have a database? We're not going to read that data again. We are going to identify, oh, those events, we already know about them. We are not giving a shit about them anymore, right? But they are the correct ones. So now you have to clean the database first. So you see, there's a lot of complexity in that involved in that. Now, uh, all that being said, the next problem that I usually see is that the, 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 the thinking in terms of data too much. Like, here's, look at this. If I build a system for renting of cars, then the first module that people are going to create will be the car module, right? Because it's for renting cars. The second one will be the user module. And the third one may be, oh, we don't need the third one. That's enough. So what happens if you focus on the, responsibility, or on, the, on the data in terms of the responsibility of the microservices is they have way too much responsibility. And then you create this kind of uh, uh, modules which are actually, uh, well, you cannot maintain them anymore. They're way too big, way too large, and the code gets messy. But the database look, looks cool. It's third normal form, fifth normal form. It's OK, right? So instead of this, think about the processes, right? And that's a single point of truth. So what happens here is that we got different modules for different processes. They communicate with each other. And if we have, uh, uh, and we duplicate the data, basically, right? And I'm talking about a monolithic application as well. In a monolithic application, it's OK to duplicate the data as long as you keep the definition of the module. Why? Because you can have a transaction over all of that. And then if nobody touches your database, there is no way this actually will desynchronize, right? OK, so we can do this. But then you have to remember another rule, which is not only your module has have to be responsible for a process, but whenever you go into events, like here, for example, car rental says car, car was rented, you have to have only a single module or a microservice telling you that event, being responsible for generating that event. Never have more than one producer of that event. Why is it important? 
Because if you don't, then you will have a problem where the different producers do not agree about that event or what happened in the system, right? So, so you always have to think in terms of a single point of truth, right? And you do that because you want to be able to ensure invariance, which means stuff that is always true. So here's an example. We have car rental module. And that car rental module actually is responsible for saying you can rent that car only if it's not already rented, right? So what I would do, I, I would use a database, for example, do an um, optimistic log or the, the pessimistic log in car rental, and that's all I need, as long as I'm the only one who can tell, say the car was rented, right? Now, the problem is that if you do it like that, then how about the returning of the car? Well, you can have another module saying the same thing, but if these are microservices, which means you no longer have a transaction, then how about creating an invariant like you can only return a car which has already been rented and is not returned yet? Now we need that information back from car rental to car return. So either you create a cycle, or you can extract a third microservice, or you can merge them, right? But by default, don't merge them. Don't put too much information into a single place just because you want, you like, you know, the third normal form or something like that. Try to spread it out. Try to make, it, make the modules responsible for processes and especially microservices because in microservices you have to do it. Okay. The another problem with this approach is what happens when you want to have like a perspective on the situation where, where, where are our cars? I want to see a table when I see all the cars that are rented and their location, right? Not a single microservice has that information. Before, we could have that, right? In a car module, I have all the information about cars. How about now? What happens next is what you should do is you create another module or a microservice which feeds basically on the information from other modules or asks them using queries, and then you create there a perspective of the system. And again, in a modular monolithic system, you got transactions, so it will not go out of sync. And in a uh, microservice or distributed system, what will happen, happen is that you will have eventual consistency. So that's guaranteed. You cannot do it any other way because of the speed of light and the speed of sound as I'm talking to you, for example. You always get the information later on, right? So that's how you approach this. And then we move to orchestration and choreography. And there was a lot of orchestration uh, choreography before said uh, on the previous um, lecture. So uh, all I'm going to point you to is that whenever you have a module that tells older modules and microservices, this is especially important in microservices, that tells older microservices what to do, you assume that you understand at least when their processes are getting started. And most likely, you assume that you understand their processes, right? And as with commands, which are, from one perspective, a, lot, uh, a little bit uh, problematic, that knowledge will get out of date sooner or later, right? And that's orchestration. You assume that you know everything, so you're going to tell everyone what they should do, and uh, uh, sooner or later, that would not be the truth anymore, right? OK, so instead of orchestration, what you can do is choreography, when you only reason about the local situation and you tell others what you know about yourself, and you never reason about other modules. And if you have a system built on with several teams, that's the only way you can do it. Because no matter what you will try to do, you will not have the same knowledge in your head that the team will have that is responsible for calculating the cost. So now choreography is telling everybody what I know and allowing them to do what they need to do when they need to do it. So it's about autonomy of different teams. That's especially important when you're building a distributed system or when you're having several teams. When you have a single team, again, you could go with uh, orchestration. But from my perspective, I never go into orchestration as a default. I always try to create choreography just because it's easier and it allows me to, uh, to basically reason locally, right? OK. So the next problem is that people do not think about the different uh, non-functional requirements or quality requirements when they're building their systems. Let's say there was a situation actually half a year ago, I think, or something like that, here in Poland, when we had a system for registration of the patients that would be used by the patients when they want to register for vaccination, and then with the nurses would actually use the same system to do the injections so they know who they inject and, you know, all that stuff. 
And if you look at this, what is important is that the, you know, the, the amount of patients is large. So basically, you, you don't know how many you have, and there is a low SLA. If I cannot register today, I can register tomorrow, right? On the nurses, okay, uh, nurses side, that's a different situation. You get a fixed number of RPSs just because you have so many nurses, and not anymore. And on the other hand, you got a very high SLA because, you know, you got those uh, injectors ready, you got those vaccines, and uh, you got the whole process. People are queuing up, right? So that's important. And what happened in Poland in a system when my generation, people born after 1981, was allowed to actually register for the, uh, for the vaccination, we did what we do best. We created a denial of service attack, right? And we took the whole system down. And all the people that were already in there, you know, getting the injections, they couldn't do it anymore. So what that teaches us, very simple thing. Always think in terms of, you know, do I have to provide different quality attributes? And if I do, how about splitting this, this application into two applications? You don't have to go into microservices yet. Just have different applications for different quality attributes. Now, what that means is that if patient registrator, registrator would just register patients and then later on give that information as an event to patient injector, another application, you wouldn't have that problem. We would kill, we, I mean my generation, would kill the patient registrator, but the nurses could still work. Simple as that, right? Now, this is important because people usually think in terms of availability like what the companies do. They say something like, we have three different levels. Like we get golden level and silver level and the bronze level, right? This is completely bullshit. And if, even if they give you numbers, like, you know, our system has got to be up, like we have to provide three nines or five nines, something like that. That's also, also bullshit, because when you go into distributed systems, and you can always have a little distributed system by having just two applications, then what that means is that you have SLA per process, not per the whole system, okay? And when you think in terms of per process, you will find out there's a lot of processes which are super important, should have high SLA, and a lot of them which are problematic but do not have high SLA, right? So what does it mean, in fact? You can take a module and basically split it into different, different modules. Think about the CQRS. CQRS is a pattern that does exactly that. And then you can move it out into a, another microservice or another application, and the failure mode will not impact that one. So basically will not impact the SLA of that process, which is involved with you know, using that module. And think in three terms. We, in, the, in development, think usually in terms of, you know, I want to make this available all the time. So what do I have to do? I have to, like, I'm going to spin up 100 different nodes and have 100 instances. So if some of them die, some of them will still live on, right? Now, that doesn't work uh, that, uh, that, that well because you are doing deployments, and maybe you remember when Google actually deployed like a new version of some kind of a critical software all across the world, and like the, the, the whole world was blacked out because that was the same version, and the problem actually appeared later on, and not in the first five minutes, so they kept, kept basically rolling up the update, and when they updated everything, then the whole thing went down, right? Like with memory leaks, for example. You will have the same kind of a situation unless you are good at monitoring memory. Okay, so that's one problem. But there's another way to do it. And Evasion actually does this. So what they have is they say, to be able to provide a very high SLA, what we want to have is we want to have as little redundancy as possible. Basically, as little moving parts as possible. So the planes do not have additional engines to keep them flying. They have as, as little number of engines as it is possible so that you can keep those engines working all the time, doing, you know, reviewing the, their state and basically fixing them, and they shouldn't work, look like this in the air, right? Now, that's easy for the aviation, at least somehow easy for the aviation industry, because their engines do not change as, as you know, as you use them. Basically, they shouldn't change in terms of there are no new features when you fly, right? Now, that's not the case for us, right? Or maybe it is. It all depends. Because when you look at your system, all the modules and microservices of your system, what you will find out is there are modules and microservices which have a lot of changes, and there, are, there is stuff which doesn't, right? You might even have an old monolithic system out there, legacy system, non-modular non monolith that you don't hate, but it works, right? It's still up. It's, it's OK. It works. 
So what can we learn from that? The, actually, the research comes from the Microsoft, because Microsoft has a lot of experience in failing systems. Um, and so they found out a very simple thing. If you have a lot of changes, you will have a lot of bugs. If you don't have many changes, you will have less bugs. Why? Because developers write code. Code is buggy. So basically, we provide bugs to the system, right? So what that means is if we could have a module that doesn't have a lot of changes, we can provide the high SLA very easy, right? No problems with that. But if you have a situation when you, have, when you want to have a lot of changes, so a high frequency of change, and at the same time, you want to have high SLA, that's a huge problem. This is going to be the, the, the most problematic module or microservice usually. And basically, that will also mean that you will have a lot of stress. This will be, uh, this will be uh, like the most difficult part of your system. What can we do with this? Maybe we can take a single process, split it into different steps, and find out that for this step, the SLA is got, has got to be high. But for the rest of the steps, it doesn't have to. And they change a lot. And this part doesn't. And then you take that and you split them into different microservices. And so you can provide high SLA for something that doesn't change a lot. And then you can have the rest of the system with all the changes, but you don't care about you know, breaking stuff up. And actually, this is how I built a lot of my systems after I learned that. And it gives you that freedom when you can deploy and break stuff and you have no stress whatsoever because, you know, the SLA for that microservice is exactly zero, right? If it doesn't work today, then it's going to start working tomorrow and it's still going to be okay. And the rest of the process is actually something I do not touch that often. And that's it. So we can learn on that. Please write the, uh, read the paper. But it's basically a very simple paper and it just explains High SLA, high frequency of change, no go. You don't want to have services like this, right? OK. And the last part is eventual consistency. And that's, uh, you know, that's the thing that a lot of newcomers to architecture, or basically young developers, they are very afraid of. And I blame the universities for that, because they teach, they still teach relational databases, which is OK, it's important, right? They teach you the third and fifth normal form, and they don't teach you anything how to connect that with the ob object-oriented programming, for example, or how to do it with the uh, distributed system. They tell you, yeah, you got a cluster, and the whole database is actually a cluster, so it is a distributed system, and that problem is already solved for you. And that's not true. So basically, what you have to understand is eventual consistency is very easy to achieve because the whole world works like this. Nothing here is not eventually consistent. I'm sending, I'm talking to you, and the moment you receive those words is limited by the speed of sound, and for the people on the internet, by their cable, basically, right? So that, that means that you never have the, the strong consistency there, and you don't have to. You just have to start thinking in other ways. So I see a lot of people being afraid of that. They shouldn't. And it's very easy to uh, achieve. You just look at the transactional outbox pattern, or maybe not even transactional, because it doesn't have to be transactional. You look for the outbox pattern, and you can implement, you know, implement it everywhere, right? OK, so with all that said, I would give you a few books that I think are worthwhile if you are starting with software architecture, OK? The whole thing is already online, so you don't have to uh, make notes. The first one is Software Architecture for Developers by Simon Brown, which is a very basic book, and it's great, because that's exactly what should be at, at every university as the base, right? Then you got Fundamentals of Software Architecture by, by the way, Neil Ford, who was here before, uh, like one hour ago, right? And it's also a very good book. The both of those books, you might not be ready for them when you start architecture yet, but read them anyway, because, and you have to return to them year after year, and you'll uh, learn and understand more. Now, the next thing I would recommend is Designing Event-Driven Systems, because that's a book that is going to explain a lot of things about event-driven systems to you, even though it focuses on Kafka. And even if you don't have Kafka, those rules still apply. Okay? Then I would suggest Reactive Design Patterns, which is another interesting book, which will not teach you how to do reactive programming, just in case you were wondering about that but it will explain all the reasoning behind how the reactive systems are built, what is the basic for, for all the solutions out there, and what you should think of. 
So these books, they are very good books, and you should definitely read them. They are, you might have a problem when um, they are not practical enough, perhaps. Yeah, they are a little bit abstract because they are books, right? So you might not be ready for them, but you have to read them anyway and return to them. And then you have to read the team topologist just because every single system that you're going to build is going to be constrained by the people that you have and the teams that you have. And this is the biggest constraint that you have. Okay? So if you think this is all about you know, performance or about maintainability, it's all about the people. And so you have to learn how to deal with the situation that you have. If you have a team, or maybe you have five teams, and one of those teams is kind of a toxic one, right? What do we do with that? Well, how about giving them a part of the system nobody depends on, right? They can be as toxic as they need, but nobody's going to give a shit about them, right? What if you have a team, and in that team you have one single person which is toxic, and you cannot fire them because they drink vodka with the owner of the company, for example? What do you to do with that? Well, how about creating a module that nobody cares about, that person will only talk with the, with the, uh, with the business, right? And he's going to piss off the business usually, but okay, collateral damage, right? And they are not going to be in your team anymore. Okay, they will be in your team anymore, but nobody cares about them, nobody listens to them, they, don't, they have their own code base, right? Simple solutions to complex topics. And you have to understand that. And don't fight against it. Like, you want to fix every single person? Don't do it. Don't try to do it. You can teach a lot of people, you can help a lot of people. Don't, pe don't help the toxic people, okay? Just eliminate them by moving them somewhere where they can be toxic, as toxic as they want, right? This is like a nuclear waste, that's it. All the toxic people are here, and they are happy, and we are happy, and everyone is happy. Why not, right? So Team Topologist explains a little bit about how to set up different teams, how to do it with a uh, distributed system especially, and basically what kind of a things that you will need when you have a system not built by five people, but maybe 50 people, maybe 200 people, right? And I was definitely not ready when I, when I started working on the system of this scale. And the last one is the golden one the domain-driven design, and actually this was the only book that was present at the time when I, when I started, 18 years ago, right? And I read that book, and I didn't understand a shit about it, right? The problem with the book is, it's great, but it's making me sleepy every single time I read it, or I, at, at, least, at least 18 years ago when I read it, it was like, yeah, it's a great book, but I need to you know, go to bed now. And what I found out, that after a few years of horror, and tragedy on production, I went back to this book, and it was the best thriller that I've ever read, okay? Because I, I, I could see all the, you know, the drama around all the problems that were described there. So this is a very important book. Don't worry if you, if you keep falling asleep, you come back to it later on, you will see that it's very, you know, it, 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 there is a lot of tension there, it, it really kicks ass. And also, remember that half of that book is only the patterns for communication between different, mo uh, different bounded contexts and different modules and microservices. And half of those patterns, we have better solutions now, right? So just assume that there, for, for a lot of those things, like there are better solutions now, you have to go to the, the conferences and see, or maybe, maybe just read a, a, a fresh book like The Fundamentals of Software Architecture where some of those patterns are there, but they are being pointed out that, you know, don't use it anymore. It's old, okay? It sucks. So that's about it. Good luck with your architecture. And if you have any questions, I'm available for a minute and a half. Thank you.